welcome to the first of many webinars ColorLogic and CrossX Color will be holding. ColorLogic and CrossX Color are partner companies who sell high-end color management solutions. ColorLogic and their sales team serves the European market and rest of the world. CrossX Color and their sales team are serving the American market. In this uh, webinar of today, we are um, working with two of our tools, Copra and ColorEnd. We are optimizing bad measurement data with color end, including the evaluation of measurement data, before we are creating the profiles with Copra for CMYK and RGB printer profiles. We will look specifically into special features of Copra, being the perceptual rendering options, the black generation and black point options, viewing conditions and others. A very important part of my presentation is how to check and evaluate if an ICC profiles are in a good quality. I will show tools and methods to make this critical step fast and easy. We are going to convert images with the Cobra image conversion feature and we are using test images and evaluate those test images inside Photoshop. I will show and compare profiles with poor quality measurement data um, versus optimized data to, so that you understand the relevance of color end. So that's the first webinar we are going to do. We will hold a few other webinars because Copra is such a very mighty functionality. So it has printer profiling, it has device link profile, it has safe ink profiling, and it has editing functionalities. We can't cover this all in one seminar. So the big star, let's say, is the full package, Copra full package. Um, and um, we will cover the device link part, for example, in the next webinar, which will be on August 19th. Where there we will do a CMYK to CMYK tack reduction in saving profiles using the device link functionality inside Copra. Um, and then the next webinar in August 29th will cover to use the device link profiles we've just created for the PDF color management. Um, we will set up typical workflows and use cases with our color server Zebra. And in future webinars, we will be covering more workflow configurations and case studies that we can use um, with our workhorse Zebra, our color server, for example, gradation corrections on the fly, device link creation on the fly with our smart link module inside Zebra. And a specific topic will be about spot color on multicolor workflows that uh, will be covered with Copra and Zebra. Before we look into the software, I want to give you a short overview of what is color end. So whenever you're working to create profiles, you're working with a lot of different test charts and measurement data. There are a lot of measurement instruments out there, a lot of tools out there that are able to save the measurement data, to record the measurement data and save them as a text file, a CXF file, whatever. And Colorant is basically able to open all those measurement data files. So you can simply open them and save them to other color file formats if you like. But the most important part is, of course, if you open and uh, if you open them in inside color end you want to visualize the measurement data you want to spot if there are some errors in there before you create the profile with this measurement data so we in color end we have tools to visualize the measurement data into different ways so that you really can see if there are some things which are not good and the even more important part you can correct those measurement errors before you create the profile. So basically you correct the measurement data, you save those optimized measurement data, and with those optimized measurement data, you are able to prepare better profiles. The advantages of color hunt is that everybody that measures color will experience issues with measurement data, no doubt. And the more you measure, the more patches you have there, the more papers and inks and, and print systems you have, the more issues you will have with measurement data. And ColorEnd, as a standalone software, corrects and optimizes this measurement data before you create the profile. So that's the, the important use case of the ColorEnd application. It works on Mac and Windows, and it can be used in front of every profiling tool, not only in front of only Copra, it can be used as well in front of uh, other profiling tools from XWrite, from uh, what other tools from, from GMG, from CGS, whatever. So you can use it everywhere. Despite the many functionality that Color Ant has, um, it has as well an automatic feature to make um, the correction quick and easy to use. Our Copra application, that's the next application we, we will show during this presentation, the name comes from Color Profiling Application and it is a complete suite of, of tools and modules. 
we have a first class ICC output profile generation option there that creates RGB, um, gray, CMYK, multicolor printer profiles. So that's one module. The other module is for the device link uh, creation. You can create device links for RGB, CMYK, gray, multicolor. You can switch between uh, different color spaces and have a lot of options in there. And we have an editing module which saves any type of color transformation into a device link. That means you can use the most mighty editing application, which is Photoshop, and do whatever kind of selective and global correction, save them as a device link profile to be used further on into your workflow, for example. Um, you, uh, we have a module for uh, safe ink profile creation, a very important module for uh, large format printers, for roll offset printers, for gravy, for newspaper printers, uh, because obviously they want to stabilize on, on, on ink and want to save uh, on ink costs by using um, safe ink profiles. Abstract uh, uh, profiles can as well be created with, with Copra, which uh, is a very unique functionality too. Looking at the advantages of Copra, um, Copra is a first-class professional applica application designed for the high-end market. We are not talking about the little guy here that has a little printer in his corner. We are talking about the real professional uh, large format printers, the real professional uh, web offset uh, graver printers that want to use the highest quality they can get. The most important um, tools that we have are about device link profiling, which we don't cover at this presentation here, but we'll cover the next uh, webinar. And we offer maximum control for the device link profile creation. Um, it has as well an easy to use high quality printer profiling tool. We will look into that during this presentation. And with that, Copra is the best profiling solution for printing companies, prepress managers and operators. Copra includes as well all profiling features for packaging and high fee printing. So uh, for CMYK plus additional inks, uh, it can be used. And it is a suite of, pro uh, of products. It includes the color end. If you buy, for example, a CMYK printer profiling module, you get the color end for free with, uh, with Copra. And we have as well the DocBeast profile manager, which uh, is uh, there to organize your profiles, which can be used to create a report uh, that evaluates your profile, a very handy tool. We'll look into that too. We are now just getting right into the application so we are starting with Copra. Um, as I've shown in my presentation, you can see here that Copra has a lot of different modules, the printer profiling module, the device linking, um, the device link editing, the safe ink. We are looking specifically into the printer profiling part. And I would like to show you how um, you would start if you would like to test yourself the applications that we have. Uh, you would get in contact with our sales team they would provide you a link to the software and a demo license and I show you how to work with a demo license. When you start the application, it is not licensed and you need to uh, register first. That's uh, done with the help um, register dialog. And here you simply load that demo license that you've received from, um, from your dealer. So I load this demo license here, which is valid till um, end of August which is then shown directly into the software and then, then you are free to test everything within the software application. So you can always go back to the home screen where you can start uh, to use each of the modules. When we start with printer profiling, a very important part of printer profiling is working with measurement data and with test charts. And I don't want to spend too much time on uh, measuring, but I will show you something um, how, how we are working with measurement data. The first thing is, if you have already some measurement data created with your device and save them to disk, you can simply drag and drop measurement data inside uh, Copra and then it um, will automatically detect the CMYK and the spectral data, for example. Um, and depending on which kind of measurement data, for example, for an RGB device, um, you can simply drag and drop this in here and it will automatically detect the measurement data. However, if you want to work with, um, with our test charts, um, we have here under help um, open test charts folder. We have different folders for CMYK, for example. And here you see we, we supply a test chart. Let's uh, do it this way. Uh, we supply a test chart, which is a typical CMYK test chart, IT8 7.4 in a layout that you can measure with, uh, 
with instruments like an I1 or a Konica Minolta instrument or a, a Barbieri a SpectroPad or LFP. So there are multiple ways to measure that test chart. If you have your own instrument that we do not directly support uh, within our application, you have always the, uh, the text file, the reference data, with which you can create your own um, TIFF file with uh, the, the layout you want for your instruments. For example, if you are a user of an ISIS, you can simply import that measurement file inside i1 Profiler, which is a free download. You can then import the measurement file here, um, uh, sorry, the, the reference file here, create a test chart, measure with the i1 Profiler, with the ISIS, save the, the data as either a CGETS text file or a CXF file, and simply import that in, inside, inside Cobra. That's quite easy. Or if you are using um, an I1, for example, or another instrument we are supporting directly, you could simply go to this button here, measure, start measurement, and then we would start a tool that comes with Copra, which is an, a tool from the UGRA, which allows us to, to measure with some instruments. You would simply go to the uh, wedge type here, to others, select one of the color logic um, strips, for example, the CMYK IT8 uh, chart. You would select your instrument. So you have uh, the choice of this kind of instruments. I don't have an instrument plugged in at, the, at this moment, but I would like to show you how we, we would measure with this virtual device. That's basically a simulation of a real measurement. Um, and uh, for example, I would just do that with this little strip to make this fast. So you would connect your instrument, for example, an I1 or a Konica Minolta or a Barbieri instrument, um, and then you would connect, and then you can um, measure directly to the application. You have different modes here for M1, M0, and so depending on the measurement instrument. And once your measurements is done, you simply say transmit, and the measurement data is, is transmitted back to Copra so that you can work within Copra with measurement data. Obviously, we don't want to create a profile from just this small media wedge, but just to give you an idea how to, you can work with in our tools. But as I've mentioned, if you have your own tools, no problem with that. Um, you can simply get measurement data inside of uh, Cobra by simply uh, drag and drop those measurement data inside. So, but I don't want to start with Cobra at this point. That was just a little um, excerpt about uh, measurement uh, data, getting me measurement data. But we want to work with the measurement data. And therefore, we are starting with ColorEnt. And um, ColorEnt is a tool to, um, to work with measurement data, to optimize the measurement data. So you can do the same thing. You simply drag and drop your measurement data in here. And you then select the measurement data. You can either double click or click on the view button to get an overview of your measurement file. So this is obviously a random layout where it's really hard to spot if there are some problems with the measurement data. Therefore, we have some other um, tools, for example, a three-dimensional view of the measurement file. So you can have a three-dimensional view here. You can um, make the dots a little smaller or bigger if you want. You can zoom in a little bit so that you have some ideas if there are some unsmoothnesses, like here, for example, this one looks a little bit unsmooth. So there are possibilities to better spot if there are some issues in the measurement file. So that's just one thing. Uh, another thing is the TVI look. So you can have a look of how the curves are behaving. You're seeing, for example, in the magenta that this is a little bit um, ugly here. In the light areas, it looks a little bit um, bumpy. And all, it, all to all, the, 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 it's not very smooth. Yeah? So you can see this here right away. So there are some issues either with the printer or the measurement data or both. Um, the spider web is a very good view as well on the measurement file. So it shows you as well that, for example, the, um, this uh, blue axis or the cyan axis or um, the, the, the green axis here, they, there are some, some, yeah, some really odd behaving things in here that you really want to optimize. And the other thing is in the curves itself, you can see how, for example, this, the black curve, you have different curves here, you can see all the, the curves. In the black curves, the black curve behaves. And you see something here, for example, the, for, for the 40% um, black patch, there are two of those patches inside the measurement data. 
And uh, that's a very important thing to understand because um, mostly in test shards there are multiple um, patches in different locations to check, for example, how evenly the printer is printing. However, if in this case you have the same patch with two different LAB values, which of the two values should the profiling use? And um, we call this redundant patches, and obviously we don't um, want to use either this or this. We want to use the average of this, uh, of this, those two patches. And therefore, we have a tool here which is called the redundancy correction. You simply go there, you choose the automatic mode. We have different mathematic models here. The automatic will automatically determine which is the best to be used. So I would uh, recommend to just use the automatic one. You click on OK, and the view is directly updated. And you'll see, I will go back here, we'll have always the history in here, so you can go back to the former values, and you'll see the redundant patches, there are multiples in here, you should see those, you see those, you see those, um, they are now all corrected and averaged. So you have already a better data set. Um, let's have a look into, for example, the magenta curve, um, here again, looking before and after, and we still see this quite odd behavior here and we want to optimize that further. This can be done then with the next step which is the correction step where we want to correct what we call bad measurements. So we do that and let's look at the first thing we've done, we started with. So we had this odd behavior here and after the correction we have a much smoother, much better behaved curve. Now, um, we will see as well in the spider web that we're starting from from here with all this odd behaving um, colors here and after the correction we see okay that's much much better now. Still there are some unsmooth behaviors but this is a strong correction. We might want to smooth the measurement file further because the data is quite acceptable. I would just take the data as it is after the correction but however I would like to show you what smoothing would, would do. If you go to the smoothing you have some option here for a very strong smoothing or a very weak smoothing or a middle smoothing. You can even protect the highlight areas. This is very important for, for our Flexo customers that don't want to smooth out the um, highlight bumps um, that they have in Flexo. So they can say, okay, I don't want to smooth anything until 8%, for example. You know? In this example, it's uh, from a, an LFP printing process, so we don't have the Flexo um, behavior here, and we want to do the smoothing for, for the entire call space. So if I do that, um, we will directly see how this reacts in, uh, in uh, the, the spider web. Now it's looking very, very nice, very smooth. We have fine, uh, clear lines here um, for our, all our um, um, CMYK and RGB um, colors in there. Again, if I'm going back to what we had at the beginning, after the correction, which is already good, and after smoothing, you have a much finer um, granulation here in, in, this, in, in this data, which gives you a better result at the end. If you want to know how much we have changed the data, um, we can go here, I will switch off the view to the color comparison. Here you select the original data set, and here you select the one after all the corrections you've done. So I'm selecting this one at this point, and if you move with, with the mouse either here to, to the side or to the button, you will see on top the average over all patches, 0.4 delta E and the peak of 2. Which means despite all those nice uh, optimization we have done, it is only a small change. It is only a small change which means we are very close to the original characteristic of the printer. We are not changing the characteristic of the printer. We want to characterize the printer as it is, but we want to smooth out, we want to correct this, those little errors that are still in there. And we have done that in a very good way, as we've seen. We have only a very small um, change in the maximum um, delta E and a very good average on, on everything. Um, if we want to compare uh, to, to just the correction, I can simply select just the corrected version here and we can see, okay, that's even less correction to the original data. So we have just an average of 0.2 around and a peak of below 2. Yeah? So that's not much. If you want to have 
a look on um, where those patches are, you can simply use the slider here to move them. And for example, if you go here to art from, from, from 2 delta E on, to 2 delta E 2000 on, it will only highlight those patches that are now uh, having higher than 2 delta E. And it's basically this, this green patch only. So this is the, the highest delta E that, that we have here. On the graph window, we even see a better distribution of how the dif differences between those two uh, characterization data is, uh, is compared, and we have a statistic um, uh, window as well. So that's quite a very helpful functionality to compare measurement data, and you can simply click on each of the patches, um, and you'll see um, um, on, on the one hand the the, the, the the LIB values from this patch, from this, from this test shot, and here on this, on this uh, below part, you see the measurement data from this part. So you have a good view here how those colors compare. So, and if we want to uh, work with this measurement data, you simply go there, um, and you can simply click on save. Um, you can save the measurement file to a different kind of format. We want to use the text file here, but you can save it as a color exchange format if you like. We'll save it as a text file here, we'll save it as a desk to, to our desktop, and then we have our measurement file, which we could then use inside Copra. Another file I would like to show you is from a really bad measurement data that I have, um, which is coming from a digital printer. And we basically have um, the similar thing. We want to look a little bit on the measurement data and we just double click here and we see, for example, the spider web, which is very, very odd behaving. We see the three-dimensional view, which uh, shows us, well, there are really some, some issues, some problems in, in the data. Or if I look into the curves, there is a lot of noise in there, a lot of problems in there. However, still, it is a random chart, and it's really hard to spot on a random chart which are the issues that I'm having. Therefore, I would, I would like to start a little bit different with the rescaling tool. I uh, go to the rescale and I can um, reformat the layout to something which is more visual, like for example an IT874 or an ECI2002 layout. Um, if I'm selecting that and I click on start, you'll have a much better view on how the colors are distributed and you're seeing all the artifacts already um, in a much better way. And we are still on the remission data, meaning the spectral data. We don't change the spectral data. We just reform uh, format the data um, and we keep the data as they as they are um, that means we have a look good view on the unsmoothness here we see some artifacts in here we even see some artifacts here in the gray we see it's getting darker which is okay but then it's getting lighter again darker lighter again so we see all this kind of artifacts which we obviously can see as well in the tvi curve if you look here into the black curve, that's exactly what we've seen. It gets darker, then it gets lighter, it gets darker again, and so on. So it's not really nice, and the magenta is even worse than the yellow too. So we want to do some optimization here. We, you could do this correction as I've done in the first example by using all those tools, um, one after the other, or you could simply use the automatic feature, which does uh, the correction that, is, that are needed automatically for you. So you just simply click here, say start, and it would do this correction for you automatically in the right order. And doing this, after the correction, you see you have a much better behaved um, data set, which gives you much better profiles at the end. So if I'm now looking into the TVI curve, so that's much, much smoother um, compared to where we started from, which was like this. Yeah, so our measurement data is much better. Obviously, this, this printer has some severe problems. The spider web is still an ugly one and the data still is, is, is ugly. But sometimes you simply have to take the measurement data as it is and sometimes it don't get even better because the device is that bad and you have to print with it anyway. So you want to get good measurement data um, to work with. Um, here in the history you can always get back to each of the steps and uh, go there and uh, go from each of the steps. So, if, for example, if you don't want to have the smoothing, you simply click on the correct one, and then you, we are going one step back, and we have just the corrected uh, data. In this example, obviously, we want to have the smooth uh, data as well, so I click on Smooth, Save to Disk again, 
and I save it here to my des desktop again so that I can create a profile. So that's about color end in this demonstration, at least at, at this point. And I will switch now to Copra to create the profile uh, from this example with this bad behaved measurement data. So what I would like to do is to create two profiles. One profile with the original, not optimized, bad, really bad uh, behaved data and the one with the optimized data so that we have a good comparison then when we apply those profiles in, in, uh, later on on a test image to see what's happening and how, how it improves the profile quality. So I'm selecting a, um, a, a setting which I've created uh, upfront. We will look into how to create settings and what's, what that means later on. S select the setting here, you're going to next and you're giving the profile a name. So this is my digital printer. Um, you select the format that you want, either ICC version 4 or 2, select the 2. Um, you select the, um, the, the size of the profile, large is a good compromise, and then you create the profile. You will get an information because with a demo license we will create a demo profile, which is basically uh, a profile which uh, is encrypted. So you can't use that profile in, for example, Photoshop, but only within our applications. So we create the profile and you see there's a new dialog coming up, which is this uh, batch profiler di dialog, which allows you that during the calculation, you don't have to wait. You can simply go back and create another profile with different settings. And that's what we want to do. We want to take our optimized measurement data. I simply select this, this here. Um, I select the same setting, so we want to create another profile with the optimized data and I create another profile. Again, a demo profile will be created and you'll see during the first one has been finished, the second one is starting. And you could now create another profile with different kind of settings. So I've created those profiles already, so we leave, uh, we leave Copra calculating the profile, but we can use them already. So we are going to the image conversion. And here you have the choice to work with this demo profiles. You can't use the demo profiles somewhere else. You can use them inside our Copra application, but you can do all the color conversion within this image conversion feature. So you select your source file that you want to convert. I've uh, selected here uh, one of our edit targets that we supply with uh, Copra. These are very good test images to evaluate the profile quality. You'll find those images here under um, auto Open Edit Targets folder. And here we have one for CMYK, for gray, for LIB or RGB. And that's the RGB one, which I've selected here. But in my example, I want to use another one. This is uh, this test image. You simply drag and drop that here. So this image has uh, some well-known test images like the Roman 16. It has some smooth shades here, some high saturated colors. So it gives a good overview about the quality of the profile. You select the source profile. It has an embedded profile. It shows us here. So I select the source profile ECI RGB and I then select um, my uh, digital printer profile I've just created. So we are starting with the original one um, I'm selecting here. You select the uh, the rendering intent we want to convert with, so either perceptual or black point compensation, we want to use the perceptual one. We embed the target profile in here and we save the converted file to disk. You have the choice of either, either TIFF, JPEG or PSD. I'll take the TIFF here and this is the um, original bad data conversion and profile I'm using here. So I save that to disk. And obviously we want to compare it to the optimized data after the color end uh, optimization of the measurement data. And I save this one to disk two and I call it optimized. So I have two TIFF files now that have been um, converted with the image conversion tool. And I can simply select them and open them inside Photoshop for further inspection. So if I do this, um, this is my original bad data and if I zoom a little bit in, you'll see all this unsmooth behaved um, conversions here. That's really, really bad behaved. You can see it as well in the image here. This blue is really uh, spiky with a lot of artifacts in here. You can see some artifacts here in this area 
where um, it's getting lighter and very dark in this area so that is looking really bad. You have some detail losses in the hair of this guy here. So it's really not a very nice conversion. However, if I take the optimized profile, the profile with the optimized data, you'll see it's much, much smoother here. You don't have that artifacts in the blue anymore. You have a good um, dark background, so there, there's not this, those artifacts anymore. And there is detail in the hair of this guy. So I'm switching bad back to the bad data. You'll see some, even some artifacts here in the green are, can be spotted and after the correction it is much much smoother. So this shows the, the, um, the importance of color end to optimize the measurement data before you create a profile. Now we want to look a little bit more into the details of how to create good printer profiles and I will um, start with uh, the example with, with the better data that we had and we want to uh, this time want to look into the details of how we create profiles. So we have two options here. We just go there and we have a general tab and the black generation tab. I'm starting with a black generation and here you have the option to select a setting as in the previous screen and which for example if you are on an offset printing um, process you select one of those presets and depending on the presets you will see that all the settings are changing and you get another view of the separation. Now, for example here that's the digital printer demo I've used, or if uh, in this example, this is an inkjet kind of device. So I'm selecting this setting, for example, as a starting point. And here you have the typical suspects, let's say. You have an UCR, you have a GCR option. If you are working with a GCR, you can define the amount of the GCR from a very weak one to a very, very strong one. So we have options there. You can define how the black start shall work. So for example, for an inkjet, you typically want to start quite late in, uh, with the black so that you don't have the peppering effect in the light areas. You have a black width slider that you can move. And a very important part as well of a profile is the black point. And the black point determines the contrast basically and the details you will get. Therefore, the black point is so important. We have some options here to how to calculate the black point and the automatic feature is a very helpful one because it gives you an indication from the measurement data that you have how, how you should set the measurement data in the auto mode. But you can start from scratch by simply dragging it to the maximum and then simply clicking on this little gear here, which calculates the recommended black point for you. So uh, if I click here, it gives you that value. And why is that recommended? We can have a look here because we give the LIB values for the black point that we are going to calculate. This is an, the L star and this is A and B. We want to create an as neutral as possible uh, black point. So it's zero, zero, that, so that's fine. And we see we have an 18 L star, which is a dark black point, but not as dark as it could be. However, if somebody says, okay, I want to check, um, perhaps I can use something like uh, 300%, you can simply go there and select 300% total area coverage. Now, for example, we go there. And if you now click the gear button here, you'll see what happens. You get a neutral black point, yes, but your, uh, your, your L star is getting higher, which means you're getting lighter in the black point, which means you're losing contrast. So it's not a good idea to go down to 300 or even more if we go down this way, very hard way. So you, you lose contrast and that is not a good thing to do. So you rather want to stay higher in the total area coverage. For example, if I go there, we'll see what happens. We have a 19.5, which loses already some, some details. If you go there, we can see, okay, 385 is the best compromise, it seems. So we take this as our starting point. Obviously, this is possible with an inkjet system. After linearization, you probably want to start with a very high total error coverage. On an offset kind of process, you, you never want to use something like 385 or an uncoated paper and such. And therefore, we have those nice presets here. For example, if you're in an offset uncoated world, you uh, want to use something like 280, for example, um, rather than uh, 380. Going back to my inkjet, you'll see that all those settings which are here, um, all the settings that I'm using, 
will be an F modified, like this inkjet edited one, um, has this edited um, mentioned at the ending, so that I can go back to my last setting, which I've selected before I switched to, to the other setting, um, so I don't lose any settings that I've, I've done. And I could rename that to my personal um, inkjet uh, test, for example, and in the, in the future setting, in the future use of Copra, I always have that setting available so that I can apply it to uh, incoming data that I want to use with the same setting. And that's the way how I've created my digital printer demo example as well, um, that I've created this way, so I've re renamed the setting um, to my purpose. I want to use that in inkjet test, and I'm creating that profile now, so that's my, um, my inkjet. Um, inkjet profile with a tag of 385 and this time I want to use the, uh, the profile report functionality because when it creates the profile, again a demo profile will be created, um, I'll have the nice functionality that it gives me as well some information about how good this profile is. Because typically if I'm creating a profile, well, what, what would I do to evaluate how the profile is? I would take a test image, a good test image with a lot of details in there, with a lot of uh, gray balance uh, parts in there, with some difficult images, with some smooth images. And I want to look at separations. I want to see how, um, how smooth the gray balance is, how the separation is. I want to see if my... Um, if my total area coverage is, is reached, or if I have some artifacts in there. And all this kind of testing can be done manually, no, no, no doubt about that, but it takes a lot of time. And um, you will see here that after the creation of the profile, we will get an automatically generated profile report, which will open up in, in Acrobat later on, which gives you all this kind of information. For example, we can see the precision of the profile, how good the profile is able to reproduce his own measurement data. This is shown here in this, in this line, where we see the average and the maximum um, error that we have in that profile. So overall we have an 0.1 delta E average, which is very, very exact, and only a peak of 2.5, which is very, very good. We can see how the total area coverage is. This is exactly the total area coverage we've entered inside Copra. So we can see that this is, uh, this is uh, reached within the profile. We, we see the information about the black point and the white point. And um, further on, we have a look on the gamut. So a profile has multiple gamuts. For example, it represents the measurement data, the absolute chromatic gamut, that's the red one. When you use the relative colorimetric rendering intent, you have a slightly bigger color space, which is shown here in the, in the green one. And with the perceptual, um, gamut, uh, perceptual rendering intent, you get uh, the gamut mapping, and therefore you get a bigger color space at the end. Uh, you have the spider web, which we show here as well. And we have some gamut volume information. For example, we want to know, is this printer able to reproduce, for example, an sRGB or Adobe RGB or isocoded. And for example, if I want to prove isocoded on this inkjet printer, I see, well, isocoded is a little bit bigger, so it's not a good idea to simulate isocoded because that ICC profile is a little smaller. So I can't use it for proofing. And obviously, um, sRGB and Adobe RGB profiles are, have a much bigger gamut so you can't reproduce them entirely, but that's a normal thing. You can't reproduce um, Adobe RGB exactly on any printer in this world. The next thing we want to know is how smooth and how is the gray balance set up. Uh, we can see it when we do the perceptual rendering or relative plus black point rendering. So we'll see that the gray balance is okay, that our starting uh, black is quite late, as we set up in, in the profile. We have some other information here about relative colorimetric and absolute colorimetric, how the gray balance reacts. Uh, next thing we want to see is how good is the profile when it should render a very smooth Adobe RGB um, blend of colors um, into CMYK. And we see that's the original one, that's the CMYK uh, conversion with the perceptual rendering intent. We see that's very, very smooth, no artifacts can be spotted, so that's quite nice. 
um, and we see how the conversion is done with colorimetric plus black point compensation, so that's very nice too. And typically I want to see how is a CMY without black. So I would go to Photoshop and go to the channels and switch off the, cha the, the K, and that's done here for me automatically. So I see the CMY perceptual conversion without the black, so I can see if there are some problems in the CMY, but that's all smooth, so very nice. And I want to look into each of the channels, looking at the, the black channel, the cyan channel, they're all looking without having some artifacts, magenta, yellow, that's all fine. So I have all this information right into that report without me having to do anything. So that's really helpful to get a fast overview about the quality of the, of the profile. That's our, um, our test image, our image which we here in this report have assigned Adobe RGB to. We can see how it should look in the original and this is the converted one using the perceptual rendering. Obviously we can't reproduce this, those high saturated colors, but still we have very high saturated uh, um, yellows and reds and blues. The gray balance is very nice and there are no detail losses, so that's all fine. This is done with the perceptual rendering or with the colorimetric plus black count compensation. We can see that for this image using the perceptual rendering intent will increase the highlights a little bit over the um, black point compensation which gives a better rendering and details in uh, the shadow and mid, mid tones. So that's all fine. We get some information as well um, about uh, for example edge values. How is the pure red, green and blue in RGB is rendered to CMYK? I get this information right here so I don't have to put a patch in, in inside Photoshop where I have to go to, with a pipette in there and to see how the CMYK values are. I get this information right here into that report. I can see how the rendering is done using the chromatic plus black point compensation or with the saturation rendering intent. We have a very nice saturation rendering intent. So whenever you like more saturation than that is delivered with a perceptual rendering intent, just try the saturation rendering intent in the profile. It would give you a more saturation. Um, then we have some, let's say, geeky colors here where we compare the hues, the colors of uh, some example hues these are the original ones and these are the converted ones so that we can see how that how the gamut mapping works well that's is a little bit more for the geeks so i will just uh, go over that um, in the linearity part we show the colorimetric linear linearity of that profile um, with this if this is a pure nice line we can see if um, uh, for example an inkjet has used a good linearization before uh, the profile was created Obviously, it was not that good here in this part because we see not straight curves here. Uh, we see the dot gain calculated from the XYZ data and from the spectral data if we use spectral data. You can see those, uh, those bumpy curves here because obviously I haven't uh, used uh, the corrected data from color end. So I will do a next step with, uh, with Copra and going back into the settings. So we've created the profile with a black generation, so that's fine. And now we want to look into the general tab. So which kind of options do we have in here? And that's exactly the thing which, um, which um, I have forgotten basically in the first uh, step when I created the profile to switch on the measurement correction uh, feature. That's basically the same thing like the color and automatic button. You remember when I click the automatic button, the redundancy correction, the correction and the smoothing is, uh, is applied. For, for those people that want to get right to the result and don't want to look into the details, they can simply load the measurement data inside uh, Copra, click the measurement correction button and it will do the same correction as the color and would do. For those people that want to know more and want to have more detail information or want to do the smoothing manually in, in using the slider, they can go in there and make their own corrections. For example, for the brightener correction, this is just a checkbox inside um, color end. Um, you have here the option to do a correction with a slider setting. So you have a very strong correction or a very weak correction. And, um, uh, just to give you that information, Copra would use a 50% correction basically when you compare it to, to, to Colorant. 
So for those that want to get faster to the result, they can use this, j just the measurement processing part inside Copra. So that is one thing we could use here. We have the viewing co condition, which is basically an uh, ICC profile, always creates um, profiles according to D50 lighting condition. However, if you have other lighting conditions, you can target the profile to work better under th this lighting condition. A very nice feature and a unique feature basically is that if you have an instrument like an I1 Professional or Konica Minolta where you can measure the ambient light in a spectral way, you can load this spectral um, information inside Copra to create a profile that is then targeted perfectly for this lighting condition. Um, that means you would select the emission option here and then you would select um, the, the, the light information uh, from the viewing condition, for example here from an NLD light spectrum. You can simply open that, you get um, a correlated color temperature which is very close to D50 as it looks like, but the curve is quite different, so it gives a, a different result if you would use D50 versus the real lighting condition under which you're, you're looking at um, this print after on. So this gives a much better result for this lighting condition if you use the emission viewing condition option. But typically, if you have a normal um, workflow, you will select the default, which is D50. Um, another thing which is very important is the perceptual rendering. Um, we don't believe that this is only that there's only one perceptual which always fits in every situation. We believe we have to have different options there. And you can say um, inside the Copra application which of those three options you want to choose when you apply the perceptual rendering op option. For example, um, I lately had a client that works with an old RIP system that does not have any black point compensation. So, but he wanted to use black point compensation and we have a good solution for him because he could simply select the black point compensation here as the perceptual rendering intent and then use in his RIP the perceptual um, rendering and in fact it would use a black point compensation. So we would put the black point compensation into our perceptual rendering intent but in a much better quality than what you would get inside Photoshop because typically inside Photoshop you get a good uh, gray balance, no doubt about that. The problem is with high saturated um, RGB colors, for example. They simply get clipped, so you have detail losses in those colors. Using our black point compensation, we'll have uh, gamut mapping and therefore better details in, in those regions. I will show you that in an example file. Uh, other options here, the standard compression, that's our default setting. If you just print on one device and want to get the best uh, print out of that device, you would select the standard compression. And the absolute compression, have a look here into this, this graph, you will see that this will change, this view will change. The gray balance from, a, um, from our absolute measurement data, which is shown here as uh, this blue color, compared to the, per, uh, the perceptual rendering intent. Uh, remember that using the perceptual rendering intent, the gamut will be higher, will be bigger. But you typically have as well with black point compensation or standard, um, you will have as well that your original gray balance, which is here in this example a little bit more targeted to the yellow, will switch to the neutral. So it will be neutralized, so disregarding the paper color basically. If you want to take the paper color into account, you can use the absolute compression, which means that we will stay close to the original paper color. That's a very, very important um, option for, um, for clients that you would work with, for example, a large print buyer that wants to have uh, the same color appearance on different kind of printing processes with different kind of papers. Yeah? Uh, and he wants to have the same color appearance of the gray balance. Then you, you should use the absolute compression because on the yellowish paper and on the bluish paper, typically the gray balance will be different. On the yellowish paper, you have a more yellowish paper tint and therefore the gray balance will be yellowish. On the bluish paper, the, the gray balance will be bluish and if you put those prints side by side, it would look bad. But if you use the absolute compression on both prints, you will have the same color appearance for the gray balance. It's a very, very nice functionality, very important functionality. And I would like to show that inside Photoshop on an example that I've done. Um, here, that's the example from Adobe RGB to swap. What I've used is this one, this example image that we supply with our software. 
So that's my original example image that we deliver with in Copra. So I've assigned the Adobe RGB profile to that image as you can see here. So that's my original one and that's my converted image. This is now using um, relative plus black point only at this point. If you switch between those two, so the original one which is here, you can see those high saturated colors, you can see the, the red, green and blues, uh, magenta, cyan and yellows, really pure colors which you never are able to print on, on your print process. So you'll have this kind of degradation obviously. But you can see the gray balance is very fine, the skin tones are very very close, uh, if not the same to the original, so that's all fine. And you'll see that you have high saturated colors, but as well some, some issues just using the relative plus black point compensation uh, option if you do the conversion inside Photoshop. If you use perceptual, perceptual rendering intent using the black point compensation option within Copra, you get this result. So if you um, see here, so I've put a layered fight here with different kind con uh, of conversions so that I can switch between all the layers. If I switch back, that's the relative color metric and this is the black point compensation. So basically what we can see, we have a better definition, more details here in this, in this red area. We have more details here in the, into the blue areas, uh, which is harder to spot, but we have a, a better viewing here, uh, better details here in this area. So um, we can see that the black point compensation gives the same rendering to the, to, to the gray balance and to the skin tones, but we have more details in some higher saturated colors. Using the standard compression, we can see only a very slight difference here in this example, because uh, um, swap is quite a, a, a bigger color space, so we don't do this very strong increase of, of lightness. If swap would be a smaller color space, we would more, do even more um, increase in lightness in the darker areas. And the other one I would like to show you is the absolute compression. Um, and just have a look here into this, um, into this color here. That's basically this anchor point here, which I've set for this, this neutral gray. If we look into the original one, that's this neutral gray, which has an LAB value, which you can see on the right side of 7100 AB, 00, which means it is completely neutral. Now, if you look here, using uh, the black point compensation or relative plus black point, you'll see it has this yellow touch. And that's because the paper of swap 5, coated 5, has this yellow, yellow paper tint. Therefore, you have a yellowish gray balance at the end. So basically, this is a more yellowish gray balance, which can be seen on this LAB value. But if you use the absolute compression, have a look here, you have exactly this AB0. And that's what I've mentioned uh, at the beginning. On the yellowish paper, using the absolute compression, you have a neutral gray balance. And on a bluish paper, you would have as well a neutral gray balance. And if you put those prints to each other, they would look the, uh, the same. And the final thing I would like to show to you is, um, which is already an outlook to our next session about device link profiles. So that's the conversion that we get with the normal ICC conversion. And now we have a look into the conversion that we can get with a device link. So have a look into what you see here. So we have pure cyan, we have pure yellows, pure magentas, we have higher saturated reds, greens and blues compared to just the normal ICC conversion. And that's one of the beauties of the device links because you can have, um, you can target how the conversion should be to get higher saturated colors out there. So you get a much better yellow here with much cleaner color and um, you get better, blue, uh, better reds and better greens here. So that's really a nice improvement of the image I can get with a device link. And how to create that device link, um, I'm happy to show you in the next webinars from us. The next one will be on um, 19th of August. I would be happy um, if you would join us for this webinar. I thank you very much for joining us at this first seminar for the ColorLogic CrossX Color solutions we are offering. And I thank you for your attention.